Right, so I'm very pleased to welcome our colleague, Professor Lars Igna, here from Macquarie University. Um, Lars Igna is the Director of the Dementia Research Centre here at Macquarie University, and he's also a professor in the Department of uh, Biomedical Sciences. Now, Lars has an interesting history, I think. But from a, from a workplace point of view, Lars, I might just say, so Lars, Lars actually uh, completed his PhD at the University of Zurich in, in Switzerland in 2002. Then he did a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Zurich, where he studied neuronal stem cells and signaling pathways, and then moved to Australia in 2005. First, starting at the University of Sydney, focusing on basic pathway mechanisms underlying neurodegenerative diseases. He became an independent group leader and an associate professor at the University of Sydney in uh, 2011, and then followed by an appointment at the University of New South Wales in 2013. Excellent. Where he became a professor and head of the Dementia Research Unit and Transgenic Animal Unit in, in the Faculty of Medicine. And then in 2018, we were lucky enough that uh, Lars joined us here in, uh, at Macquarie University to start up the Dementia Research Centre. Lars is a German Research Foundation Fellow, an NHMRC Senior Research Fellow, and is a current NHMRC Principal Research Fellow. Lars has made major contributions to the understanding of the fundamental pattern mechanisms in Alzheimer's disease and frontotemporal dementia, and has identified several novel targets for drug development in these diseases. After 15 years of discovery research, he has, his research has started to evolve into the translation of these findings into novel therapeutic approaches. So Stars, Lars, I'm very glad that you have joined us at Macquarie. You have a fantastic track record. I just looked at your eighth index is 50, which is phenomenal. Um, and you're continuing to do fantastic work. So welcome to the conference. And uh, thank you very much for agreeing to give us your keynote presentation. Thank you very much, Viviana, for this very kind introduction. I also appreciate that you awarded me a PhD, which I actually don't hold. <gasps> oh. <laughs> well, I would like to give you an honorary PhD. I, I take it, you know, I take it. Excellent. Um, so this is, well, I should, for people who don't understand that, that is really fantastic. So some people don't understand that you can actually become an academic without doing a PhD, but only exceptional people manage to achieve this, where they manage to just have incredible research um, impact in which they just managed to progress through it at the um, academic cycle anyway. So clearly you've deserved and earned your PhD. Well done. Uh, here, here we go. Thank you very much. Just to clarify for everyone, to get the medical doctor in Europe, you actually have to do a thesis as well. So not much different, but it's the paperwork. Viviana also promised me that there will be an award for my presentation if I put a lot of laughter in. I think it's not the most joyful topic, it's going to be hard, but I give it my best shot to make it enjoyable for everyone. Here we go. So I'm going to talk today about um, really a 20 years journey on understanding the role of the tau protein in Alzheimer's disease and then give a, a, a short outlook on its role beyond Alzheimer's disease to actually acute brain conditions. Um, as Viviana said, we founded the Dementia Research Center in 2018, actually in December 2018, so we are roughly in our four, uh, third year now. Um, our center has seven independent um, research teams, and we cover the different aspects of dementia research, and I talk about this in a second. We are over 40 people now. We have the largest mouse collection for genetically modified mice in the space in all of Australia. We do academic and commercial production of these mouse lines ourselves, and that has really um, spearheaded our discovery research program. Our, our um, center is, is built in a very unique way that we've identified before we start the core technologies that we need to actually translate our discovery research into therapies, such as gene therapies, and into um, the human context um, by using um, miniature brains um, generated from human stem cells. So that we have generated these cores that all our group leaders can access at free and really um, to foster a collaborative um, research 
program. We do preclinical testing of drugs, not only our own approaches, we do a lot in collaboration with International Pharma to test there in our established models. And that has um, above all been um, recently a good income stream as well. Quickly. The problem is your faces are right in the middle of my presentation. Here we go. Okay, so um, the center is, has basically four tiers. We naturally continue to uh, advance our discovery research program. A huge section is the preclinical development of disease models that are absolutely critical to test um, the, the, the hypothesis you develop in the discovery research program, but also to test novel therapeutic approaches. Then the arm that is growing the most is the novel ther therapies arm where we are currently having a program of 14 different targets, spanning from antibody, small molecule, large molecule, peptide, new peptide treatments to gene therapy. And obviously being placed at the university, uh, we have embraced the culture of Macquarie um, in leadership development and education. And this has been a, become a really big part of the center as well. Um, I'm not going to introduce all of it, but if you see these guys around, this is the executive team uh, leading the center with me. We have very um, flat hierarchical structures here and we do decisions together. Um, so Thomas is leading the, the training and education arm of the center and assists me with that, while Jatze is uh, looking after research and operations. And Amy is really the good soul of our centers and looking after all of us, but also after compliance, ethics, and administration. So let's dive into the topic. I'm sure all of us have heard about dementia in one way or the other. And here are some of the um, frightening facts. Every three seconds, someone is diagnosed with dementia, and most commonly, this is Alzheimer's disease. And the scary thing is after now 100 years of research, literally 100 years of research, the cause is still unknown. Over the age of 80, one in four, so 25% of us will live with dementia. And all disease modifying trials, clinical trials, but one, which you know, there are still doubts um, for dementia and Alzheimer's disease have failed in phase two studies. They unfortunately have one thing in common. They all targeted only one target, the amyloid beta. And I would hope to convince you that um, the cause of this failure might be that we targeted in the past the wrong um, pathogenic protein. So treatment for Alzheimer's disease relies literally on two types of ineffective drugs. And this is memantine, which is a nonspecific um, NMA receptor inhibitor and cholinesterase inhibitors. There is very recently um, uh, the uh, antibody against amyloid beta, which has made quite some head wave because of the way it was approved by the FDA, the biogen antibody. And we will see if this works or not. Um, yeah. For all other forms of dementia, there's literally no treatment. So what we need is new treatments and they need to be based on novel therapies. But I think there's also hope. And so I, I like this very simple chart, which is the cause of death uh, in the United States in, in the past decade. And I like this because it shows one thing. It shows that in those research area where translation is miles ahead of neuroscience, research has made significant contributions and impact on causes of death. So all the big ones, cancer, heart disease, stroke, have been reduced by significant amounts compared to the years before. It's only the one that continues to be in the rise is Alzheimer's disease. And today we know that for women in Australia, it's the cause of death number one. And number three, I believe, for, for men. So it all started over hundred years now ago. When Alois Alzheimer um, described after um, his first patient that he described a loss of memory, disorientation, hallucination, and then finally died and got the chance to look at her brain, he described what later um, become the disease that carries his name. And he described amyloid beta plugs. Back then he didn't know it's amyloid beta, so he described these plugs in, the, in between cells in the brain, throughout the brain, and then these flame-shaped structures, 
which he correctly identified as neurons that are filled with some sort of um, fibrillar deposit. And these are his original drawings, and this is one of his original slides. Ironically, these slides actually reside in here in Sydney with a recruitment to the University of Sydney. And they managed to get these slides off in recent years and sh finally showed that um, Augusta D was carrying a um, presidial mutation. So she had one of uh, the first known cause, uh, case of a genetic form of dementia. And diagnosis has progressed for Alzheimer's disease. We have now um, head tracers where we can image and the occurrence or accumulation of amyloid beta, relatively reliable, and in more recent uh, years also of tau in the brains of people longitudinally. And this is, by the way, an autopsy brain of an Alzheimer patient compared to a normal brain. You can see here the widening of the sulci and the, and the ventricles as a result of synapse loss and neuron loss throughout the brain. But the ultimate diagnosis till today relies on post-mortem um, histology, so after death, again, relying on the presence of amyloid beta plugs and neurofibrillar entangles. So let's talk about the main culprits um, in the disease. So the first one is amyloid beta. Remember, that's the one that everyone was targeting with um, tons of trials. I think we are over 100 now, and they all have failed. But nevertheless, it's important because amyloid beta is, constitutes the main um, component of the amyloid beta plaque, which is found in every Alzheimer's disease brain. So it originates from a longer precursor protein, the amyloid beta precursor protein, which is a um, single transmembrane um, protein, which is cleaved by the beta and gamma secretors in a stepwise manner, and a um, 30A to 43 amino acid peptide is released. And this peptide is released in the extracellular space and is prone to form aggregates, oligomers of some sort, but eventually deposits to form plugs. And it exerts its toxicity at um, several receptors. And in neurons, these seem to be clustered around the post synapse, so the site of neural transmission. So it's um, not surprisingly that one of the first occurrence of degeneration is the loss of synapses in Alzheimer's disease. So there are several molecular targets that have been identified and verified in, in different ways. But the one I want to focus on is the NMDA receptor. This is the receptor that is the one that initiate, initiates learning. And I could do a whole lecture on this as well, but um, just take it as initiating learning. The one problem is if you overstimulate this receptor, you get a process called excitotoxicity, too high or too rapidly increasing intracellular calcium levels that then in initiate molecular cascades that can lead to neuronal dysfunction and neuronal death. Here we, oh, here we go. The second culprit is the microtubule associated protein tau. And this is really the focus of 15 years of my work and ongoing. So it's a protein belongs to uh, the family of microtubule associated protein. It is, comes from human chromosome 17, Q21, is a multi-exon gene which undergoes alternative splicing. And due to the alternative splicing, you have six different isoforms. And I'll show this in a second in more detail. But essentially, you have two N-terminal um, exons, exon two and three, which are either there or not, which results in, in the, these, this nomenclature. And exon 10, which is one of the microtubulous binding repeats, um, can also be present or not. Very unique for this protein. And I yet have to find another protein that is like this. It's the, this is 441 amino acid and has 85 phosphorylation sites. And almost all of them have been confirmed in, in the meantime, in addition to other secondary modifications. You see how they are clustered in, in this region and in the C-terminal. It's localized predominantly to the exon and it's thought to regulate microtubule dynamics and exonal transport. And it's really our work that has in 2010 really shifted the field from this very dogmatic view on having just an axonal um, localization to the identification of um, tau in, the, in, in post synaptic or dendritic compartments uh, where it is important for signaling pathways, both in physiology and in disease. And I'm gonna talk about this in detail. I'm having a bit of trouble with my slides. Okay. So 
there are two forms of um, tau disease, so neurodegenerative diseases with um, tau deposition. So first, the primary, primary tau disease, and these are listed here. Don't have to remember these names, but the important thing is you see they come in different flavors. So they all look slightly different. And some of them are large intraneuronal tangles. Some of them are round, small um, inclusions. The unifying thing is that they all uh, constituted the only um, lesion that's found in the brain is constituted that of tau. The secondary taupathy is Alzheimer's disease where the tau pathology um, presents in the um, presence of amyloid beta. So they're always there together. And the progression and the progression of tau pathology in Alzheimer's disease co um, follows connected brain areas. So it starts somewhere in, in the brain stem and then goes through um, two um, spreads to neuronally connected areas. And this matches the clinical progression of the disease. And just a side note, the spread of amyloid beta pathology does not correlate disease progression. And we can reduce tau levels and rescue memory deficits um, in a beta-dependent mouse model. Again, I'm going to talk about this in a bit more detail. But let's talk first about the ability of tau to spread. So it's a prion-like process. And now don't be alert, right? Alzheimer's disease is not infectious in contrast to prion disease. Yet I don't recommend uh, still um, cannibalism. So you, when you have the um, in, initiation of the pathology in, in these um, deep brain structures within the campus, it, re it results in um, a spreading of the tau pathology slowly to connected brain areas to eventually um, affect the entire brain. And this has resulted in a neuropathological disease staging called the Brux staging, where, um, and here the, the um, stages are outlined. So one and two is where you don't have deficits, it's affects only the entorhinal cortex. In three and four, where there's some neurological deficits, the pathology has um, spread to the neocortical areas. And in uh, five and six, um, almost it's found in almost all areas. Interestingly, there was a, a description in 2011 when Heiko Brack uh, looked at um, accident victims and a lot of them from, from very young ages. He found um, a pre brack stage with hyperphosphorylation and locus cerealeus, which is here, um, already at ages like 14. So it might start very well, very early. The seeding of tau can be reproduced in mice. So if you take this extract or extract tau from all these brain conditions, Alzheimer's disease and others like PSP or Pick's disease, and you inject it into a mouse brain, you get the same type of lesion in the mouse brain. So something is imprinted in the lesion in the molecule that um, allows it to propagate in a prion-like fashion um, in a spreading needle. The molecular mechanisms how this works are entirely unclear. Okay. One of the things that has assisted my work tremendously is that there have been mutations identified in the um, tau encoding map teaching. And these are all the mutations that um, have been listed by 2018. They cluster mostly around the microtubulous domain um, of the uh, molecule. So they might affect microtubule binding in, in, in some way or the other. And all those cause frontotemporal dementia. So um, a primary talk of different flavors, I might add. And I'm sure Shelley will talk about this in more detail. But what it enabled in our research and research of others is the generation of genetic mouse models that recapitulate features of the human disease. And now they are listed um, 30 uh, transgenic mouse lines. Um, on, on the ALTS forum, which is the major um, discussion platform in our field. And in, you see, this is, I think it's even outdated. You get over 3,000 hits uh, with work uh, based on top transgenic models. And I might add that um, there's quite a number of these models that I have generated over the years. Okay, jumped again one slide. Sorry for that. Yeah, 
just have to be patient. So let me introduce one of these models quickly before we move on to the AB that talks story. So this is work that was um, that I've done in, 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 in the past together with Yadze and Thomas. So we go all uh, a long way back before we joined Macquarie. And so here we generate a mouse where we picked up one of these mutations was very special in Tau because it caused one of these subforms called Pixtasis. And you see in brown here is the transgenic human gene expressed in the mouse brain um, throughout the brain. And when we looked at this in detail, we get these round inclusions and they really recapitulate what you find in the human condition. And um, it also had some other features, which I won't go in detail, but one of them is that in this, there is a one particular phosphorylation site, which is always negative in this disease, disease as you can see here. And this is also the case in this mouse model. So you can use these mice to accurately uh, model aspects of the human disease. So, so this works. A more recent work is that we try to understand how tau actually affects neuronal network before they die, before neurons die. And this is work, very recent work from Magdalena and Janet here in our center where they tested a new mouse model that we developed about four or five years ago. Actually, Janet, Janet was the one who developed this model. And where Magda and Janet could show now that in, in already in very young mice, that um, these mice present with learning deficits. And since this test comes a few times in my presentation, I quickly explain the Morris water mix. So this is a round 1.5 meter tank with filled with opaque water. And you put the mouse in a, a in, always here in, in, in a quadrant and there are cues placed around the tank and there's a submerged escape platform. And what the mice do when you put them in there and you give them a minute, they learn over time, as you can see here for the wild type mice, to swim directly to that escape platform because they're safety. And they do that by using the cues placed around the platform. But you can see, appreciate, but here, I guess this is about normally displayed at day three, that um, a, mouse, a transgenic mouse has severe problems of performing this task. So they identified learning deficits in these. They also used electrophysiological recordings to show uh, uh, long-term potentiation deficits. And I won't go into details. It's not my super area of expertise, but basically it tells you that the synaptic strengthening that's required for uh, memory uh, formation is uh, compromised in these mice. More importantly, and this is again something we do very frequently, we implant EEG electrodes in these mice and allow them to freely move in the environment, go about their day. And what we find is two things. We find these bursts of um, superactivity in the brain or um, non-convulsive or non-overt seizure activity and discharges. And at the same time, we find that the um, that the um, coupling of certain frequencies and, and phases of um, these EEG recordings, which are, re which are readouts of coordinated memory formation, including in humans, are very disturbed in these months. So there seems to be an effect on neuronal networks. And the question was how this is coming about. And so one way, if you don't, if you don't know, is to take to take this brain and do um, systems biology approaches. And this is what Magdalena and Janet did here. So they took the brains and subjected them to next generation uh, deep sequencing. And they found that at the mRNA level, there is an, a significant change in genes that are almost exclusively attributed to the excitotoxicity. And remember our immediate early genes. And remember that is the process I mentioned very early that a beta is thought to induce in Alzheimer's disease. So then they went on and found something really cool. And the thing is you can stain hyperactivated neurons in the brain and to our surprise, despite having these, um, these outbursts, there were very few of those in the brains of these mice, but they always co-localized with the presence of the transgenic tau. So the transgenic tau itself in individual neurons can result in these hyperactive neurons, which we interpret as being those that then initiate neuronal network deficits that we can measure by EEG and potentially other methods. Okay, now we do memory formation in life. We do a quick recap. So 
let's talk again about the microtubule associated protein and some more of its features because it becomes extremely um, important for the rest of my talk. Remember, it, uh, the gene undergoes alternative splicing to produce the six different isoforms with, and this, these are depicted here. So tau has a, a projection domain, which is the N-terminal part, which may or may not have the presence of the N-terminal inserts. Then there's the microtubulus binding uh, part, which um, facilitates microtubulus binding as, as depicted here. And there are three repeat isoforms, which bind less strong and four repeat isoforms, which bind stronger than that. And then there's a C-terminal tail and no one really knows what does, this one does. Remember I told you, everyone thought until recent, it's an ex purely axonal protein. So here we depicted a neuron with its um, three compartment, the soma, the dendrites, where the postsynapse sits and the axon. And tau is thought to be only the axon. And this way its function, quickly recap this as well. So it binds to microtubular, stabilizes those and um, facilitates their dynamics. In the disease, it becomes phosphorylated by kinase hyperactivity or reduced for phosphatase activity. And this phosphorylation at these 85 sites compromises its ability to bind to microtubules, which are then thought to destabilize. And in turn, the phosphorylated tau is prone to form fibrils and eventually presents NFTs. But that put us to a problem because we have amyloid beta acting at the post synapse. And its effector was always thought to be tau because that's the pathology and the change that we see. But they're really not at the same place. So we had this conundrum. How, um, how uh, um, can they act if they're spatially disconnected? So here I introduced the main idea of how Alzheimer's disease um, comes about. And that is the amyloid cascade theory, which puts amyloid beta as the initiating um, disease initiating event. And I personally believe that. Then it affects somehow on tau, which then becomes phosphorylated. And tau in turn causes neurodegeneration of the image. Once you have kicked this up enough, up enough, you don't need amyloid beta anymore. And that's why the therapies don't work. So here's some evidence for mouse. If you use a mouse um, that can form tangles, because they have been humanized. And you either um, cross the mice that form amyloid beta plaques, high beta, or inject those into the brain, you get more tau phosphorylation with the degeneration of dementia. If you do the opposite, you remove tau from the system by knocking it tau and then put them on um, a mouse that normally forms all these deficits with amyloid beta, you stop the process. And again, just throwing in, how can a mouse, if tau is so important, um, be even viable and even normal. That was a great surprise. This is a, from a review that we wrote. There were, for a long time, there were four different knockout mice and they all had literally no phenotype. And this is work from us where we characterized them at 24 months. And we don't have to go through these details, but there are no changes in heterozygous and homozygous mice that seem to be normal. Interestingly, there is a group that reported some deficits in those. And this sparked a huge discussion in the field. So what we did is, because the genetic backgrounds of all these mice were a bit messy. We generated a new mice using CRISPR genome editing with a very small deletion to leave the gene as intact as possible, but suppress tau expression, as you can see here. And what we did now, we distributed these mice, which are on pure genetic background around the world for people to reproduce their findings under their specific settings. And this is work internationally ongoing. So, but where did my journey start? My journey started with this very interesting paper from Gloria Lee and Roland Grant from 1995, one year after I left high school. And they found that when they took only the projection domain of tau, removed all of this, so all the microtubules binding effects, they expected it would like freely diffuse in the cell. But when they stained the cells and imaged them, they found this surprising finding that's very specifically located in the plasma membrane. And then this work was not followed up. So I picked this up and generated a mouse to do exactly that. So we generated a mouse that had, had this truncated form of tau, which could not bind to microtubules. And you see, we can overexpress this here. It's slightly shorter than the endogenous tau. And then we confirmed, then we, uh, when we enriched microtubules that you can see here, that it does not bind while a full length transgenic tau uh, binds. And we found also, we could also confirm um, that tau 
um, is found in the uh, membrane fraction. You can see this here. So it actually does the same like the cells. But the interesting finding was that while a full length tau overexpressed freely distributes throughout the neuron, including its dendrites, there was an absolute exclusion for the truncated form in, in this. And I think you can appreciate that there's no stain of the dendrites while the cytoplasm is very stained, very dark. It goes into the exon, um, but not into the dendrites. And this led us to um, then a, a discovery, which I'm going to explain uh, in a bit more detail. But essentially, all these plots, because I know they're very complicated, we put this cocoon together. So this experiment, we took um, an antibody that recognizes these repeats of tau, so it will not recognize the, um, the truncated form of tau. We knew it in this form of tau interacts with this uh, molecule fin, which I'm going to explain in a second bit more detail. And what happens is now in the presence of the truncated forms, this gets outcompeted. And this is what these plots show. But importantly, we found in this work, which we published in 2010, that when you look now at the distribution of fin, which is normally in the dendrites, as shown here by the yellow green over uh, the red green overlap display the yellow in the presence of the truncated form of um, tau or the tau knockout. Fin accumulates in the in the cytoplasm. So this this simple experiment shows that the postsynaptic um, postsynaptic localization of fin is absolutely dependent on tau. And remember, back then everyone thought tau doesn't even go to the postsynapse. So how would you do that? So this is summarized here in in this, this cartoon. What we found here, I don't want to go through through many years of work in detail, but there is something I want you to take away. We identified in this work a complex at the synapse that is tau mediated. And that's the complex between tau, fin, and PSD95. That's downstream of the NMDA receptor. And why is this complex so important? It's because when there is a amyloid beta present or high glutamate levels, it is this complex between fin, tau, and PSD95 that mediates toxicity downstream of the NMDA receptor. If you increase this by increasing tau levels, you get more toxicity. Again, the tau fin PSD95 complex mediates toxicity of amyloid beta downstream of the NMDA receptor. And we showed that by, um, as I said, with the truncated tau model, but tau knockout, but also with a therapeutic approach where we disrupted this uh, process. So let's dive into neural work. Then we came up with this idea and said, like, if this cascade is true, why would um, biology establish um, a molecular mechanism that causes dementia. So we wondered if like for so many biological pathways, there are feedback mechanisms. And we came up with this rather crazy idea that what everyone thought is toxic, that there might be in this 85 uh, phosphorylation site, there might be one or two or three sites that actually try to, to inhibit this pathway. And we can only stimulate those. We might be onto something therapeutic. So this is work which I'm super proud that I could actually carry out over many years together with my brother, who's, who actually is the one with the PhD. So what we found was that this PSD, uh, that the PSD95 tau fin complex that you can precipitate in very simple experiment, as you can see here, if we reconstitute this in cells, you can see here these currents of the three bands shows us a complex. When you put this uh, the, the, these kinase that Arne identified to it, which is a um, P38 gamma MAP kinase that had no known function in the brain. So indeed, we showed in this work, which published in 2016 in science, that we um, the first function for this uh, kinase. And he could show that when you use a wild type form or constantly active, so overactive kinase, that this disrupts this complex. And this was dependent on the activity of the kinase because when we used the inhibitor, um, this function was fully suppressed. This was also the case when you um, generated a transgenic mouse that overexpressed this constant active form. You could disrupt this complex in vivo. So I'm gonna jump a bit ahead and go through this a bit faster because I know this is uh, very complex, but I'm happy to take questions or um, discuss it with individuals and, and on an individual basis in, in much more detail. But basically, we could show that when we knock out P38 gamma, that um, we could aggravate the effects of tau overexpression on constituting this um, complex, as well as in the context of amyloid beta overexpression, 
um, the complex um, became much um, stronger. And this is a problem because remember in the cartoon before I told you if the complex is increased, the cells are more susceptible to amyloid beta and you're gonna have more toxicity. But what about this concept of um, um, protection? Because if you take the kinase out, it becomes worse. So the idea if the kinase is there, maybe it becomes less. So um, we did a, um, um, a in vitro uh, phosphorylation screen and identified a number of sites, but really only the ones highlighted in red were the ones that reoccurred several fold. So then uh, when we transfected the, um, or expressed piece of gamma in cells, we already could see there's one site in the trinin 205 that peaks out. So that was, was a site that seems to be very interesting. And we could see if, we, if in, in mice, that overexpress amyloid beta. So they have the Alzheimer pathology and will phosphorylate tau, as you can see here. On a P3 gamma knockout, this site disappears. So this seems that the site, uh, the phosphorylation at site 3 and 205 seems to be in this model almost exclusively mediated by P3 gamma. But the reviewers didn't believe us. So we had to mutate all of these sites and show that it's true. And actually our theory held up. None of the other sites had an effect on the complex formation. As you can see here, with all of these point mutations, the complex constituted except for the 205 site that compromised the um, complex formation. So we identified a single site that allowed um, the, um, that allowed us to um, prove our theory that there might be a negative feedback mechanism to um, endogenously suppress the function of amyloid beta. And then we moved on and tried to understand this in more detail. These are now a bit more complicated experiment because we wanted to show that this also holds up in vivo and not only in cell culture. And for that, we generated several models. And one of them I explained here. So this is now a mouse that um, is, is rather complex. It's a triple crossing. So we have an amyloid beta forming background. We remove tau, so they have no tau, these mice. And they express a constitutive active form of P30 gamma. So remember, these mice um, um, should um, have uh, no effect because the effector molecule of P30 gamma is gone. And then we reconstitute it either with wild type tau or with a, with a form of tau that cannot be phosphorylated at the protective site T205. And what you get is uh, what we expected. So mice reconstituted with wild type tau. Um, show the protective effect of P38 gamma, as you can see here by a, a reduced linear regression in the learning task. These are the orange versus the green. While in the, as you see here in the red, um, uh, red um, graphs, there is no effect, protective effect, if you um, have a tau present that cannot be phosphorylated at its critical protective site. So to put this in a cartoon, um, what has been uh, a long, uh, journey is we've identified this tau fin P95 complex that needed its amyloid beta toxicity. Now we identified the P30 gamma kinase that phosphorylates specifically T205 on tau, and this results in the dissociation of this complex and prevents the toxic effects of um, amyloid beta. So then we wondered, is this a therapy? And we did a lot of experiments, preventive experiments, but I only show you what I think is the coolest experiment. So these are mice that are 13 months old. They have severe memory deficits at this age. And then we treated them with a gene therapy vector that we're currently trying to commercialize and translate into humans. Either encoding an eGFP as a control, so a green fluorescent protein, or P the, the uh, therapeutic um, P38 gamma with a specific mutation that uh, renders it considered active. And what happens in these mice is, so remember, these have severe deficits at onset. And you see that when you inject the GFP control vector, they continue to have this deficit as, as you're seen by the um, um, linear regression, uh, linear regression analysis of the escape latency. And when, we, and when you compare that to wild type mice, so, so um, GFP injected wild type mice, H litamates um, that don't have the amyloid beta pathology, see, they perform normally. But what happens in the presence of the gene therapy vector after only two months of treatment, the mice, despite having a severe amyloid beta pathology, reacquire the ability to learn. 
so we could actually reverse deficits in these mice. And that really generates hope that for those neurons that are not yet lost and that are only compromised, not killed by amyloid beta and other pathways, that we can actually restore their function and um, thereby um, truly help people. And this is some work because you're thinking, well, we're overexpressing a, um, a active kinase in the brain in neurons specifically that could have negative effects. So we used these very old mice that have had this presence at high levels for their entire life and show that neither their um, memory is compromised, nor is their abnormal phosphorylation of tau at other sites going on, except at the protective side. And we did this in two transgenic lines, just to be safe. And we also did toxicity testing. And only when you go to literally insane levels of the gene therapy vector, you start seeing some negative effects. But these are the therapeutic um, effects that you would use in clinic prices somewhere here. And you are um, hundred to a thousand fold um, over the dose um, to start seeing some negative effects, but they're not even severe. So um, I'm coming more to the tail end of my presentation and give you a quick glimpse of the role of tau beyond Alzheimer's disease. And there are only a couple more slides. Um, so the first thing is, so me and B, who joined my, uh, my lab uh, many years ago, um, is a very impatient man. He is a vascular surgeon and he wants quick results. So he said he doesn't want to work with Alzheimer's model, it takes months. So he introduced this stroke model to our um, unit and showed that, uh, that you can induce large strokes with uh, severe brain um, infarcts and um, cell death as shown here in the white stain. So red is viable, white is, is dead um, in, in wild type mice. And he did the same thing on and tau mice and found um, somewhat to our surprise that you only have a core of the infarct but there is no um, penumbra formation or severe um, strokes in these mice. So then in a long, in a long experimental series, he, he, because the question was how this is mediated, he found yet another molecular effect of tau at post synapse. And he found this new um, um, natural regulator of MAP kinase signaling or ERK signaling, which appeared in the tau knockout mice to be increased at the post synapse and thereby negatively regulating these toxic excitotosis pathways that I talked about earlier. And when he knocked it out with, um, with shRNA in these mice, in tau knockout mice that were normally protected from the stroke, they become susceptible to the stroke again, indicating that indeed this molecular factor the single molecular factor is the one that mediates this acute role of um, um, protective role of tau reduction. So what he identified is that normally there are small amounts of syngap one that compete with uh, tau for the binding at PSD, the postsynaptic density downstream of NMDA receptor. And this is a natural inhibitor of this toxic cascade. When tau is gone, the levels increase and there is a stronger inhibition and that's why these mice are protected. And we have devised a new gene therapy that allows to increase these um, levels of syngap at the postsynaptic site in the presence of tau. And that's extremely tricky because this is the dominant factor. But if you want to go therapy, people will have tau. You can't knock out tau. So we found a way to increase this level now in the postsynapse with a genetic trick, so to speak. And um, this is just um, gone for filing for a new patient. So I've shown that trans expression of mostly mutant tau in mice can recapture aspects of human disease, including strain-specific neuropathology. We identified uh, that pathologic tau induces cell intrinsic pathways that lead to hyperexcitation of whole neuronal networks. Tau is a dendritic protein and it regulates molecular signaling pathways. And it mediates the epitotoxicity through a complex between the NMDA receptor and downstream PSD95, Fin, and Tau. There is a site specific phosphorylation of Tau that limits beta toxicity, and that's governed by the kinase P38 gamma and the effector site 3 and 205 targeting, um, targeting Tau by increasing P38 gamma activity is a new therapy, and it's based on this T205 targeting. And I've shown you a glimpse of data beyond Alzheimer's disease on the role of postsynaptic uh, syngap level regulation by tau 
and its role in stroke. So uh, let me finish with this, um, this slide, which depicts um, approaches that have been in 2009 thought about to target tau in, in dementia and that um, some of these mechanisms um, are uh, followed till, till this day. We have contributed with, with some uh, companies to anti-tau immunization strategy. We're still working on this very actively, just got a big NHMRC grant awarded uh, around this. And one of the antibodies we actually uh, characterized is, going into, uh, is in clinical trials at the moment in a phase three study. But over the past, um, doesn't work again. Here we go. Over the past years, our research program has uh, identified a number of additional ways to target tau, like PP2A activation, phosphatase activation. I didn't talk about this. This is in um, clinical trials with a Melbourne based company. Fin inhibitors are in clinical trials. Reducing tau levels are in clinical trials at the moment. P38 gamma activation, this is what we are trying to uh, spin out out of Macquarie, and I'm super excited and stoked about this. And then there are these newer uh, approaches, which um, let's see where they take us. This is the team. So whenever I say we, means not me, because I'm um, mostly in my office. Not completely true. Every now and then I'm doing experiments. But there is a huge army behind that. Um, I've mentioned key drivers along the way. But this is um, you know, work that cannot be done without collaboration, um, without um, close teamwork. And it cannot be done without funding. So I'm really appreciative of the funding from NHMRC, ARC along the way, obviously Macquarie University, and then um, other foundations who have contributed in many different ways and every dollar has helped. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you, Lars. That was a fantastic uh, presentation. Um, so if anyone has any uh, questions for Lars, please pop them in the Q&A box and I will ask them on your behalf. And I will just, thank you. Can I get you to stop sharing your screen, Lars? Is that all right? And then we can see you. Excellent, all right. So um, there is actually one question uh, from Tajal. So I'm actually gonna get her to ask that directly given that she's also a co-host. So Tajal, did you wanna ask your question for Lars? Thank you, Viv. Um, that was a fantastic presentation as always, Lars. Thank you. Um, what are your thoughts on aducanumab, which is anti-amyloid? Uh, you're putting me on the spot, John. I'm, I'm <laughs> not allowed to have an opinion, but um, so the, the idea behind removing amyloid beta has been at least questionable of the many clinical trials. So it came somewhat to a surprise that um, a antibody of just some different nature against a beta uh, reduced um, the amyloid beta levels in the brain and had clinical outcomes. Um, so there is some controversy around the approval and we, you know, there, there is in medicine is a saying who heals is right. So I think benefit of the doubt. And if it, if it works, we might not need to understand what it does. Maybe it does something other than, than we think and it helps then um, go for it. So I think only time will tell. Is it, is it also possible that um, during the trajectory of amyloid um, uh, phosphorylating tau, uh, maybe, uh, during a certain time period, if you give that anti-amyloid, it might cause some reversal. Is, is it possible? No, I don't believe that. I think you would have to go extremely early into the initiating effects. Mm -hmm. um, everything that we, that we and others have done around removing amyloid beta once the tau pathology is kicked off, and, and this includes human trials, hundreds of patients have undergone amyloid beta antibody treatment and follow up. It's, it's not working that way. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, I mean, Lars, it's really impressive, I think, the, the work that you're doing and just the way that you are, um, you know, just, I think, leading the field in terms of novel, novel ideas. Are there many other groups that are really looking at these sort of how is a potential treatment mm. target? Or, I mean, obviously you are, but is there much going on yeah. elsewhere? Look, um, 
before we published the paper in Cell, there wasn't much going on in this. And um, now this, this paper has been cited one and a half thousand times, has been rev reviewed, uh, reproduced by many, many groups. There are whole um, companies which, you know, so, some I talk to, some I don't, um, have started um, years ago projects on developing these, these drugs. And yes, so there are many groups, unfortunately, many competitors in the meantime. meantime so it's becoming harder and harder to publish our findings. Um, but yeah, so, so I, I guess, yes, there is this, this changed the view and has really put Tau in the line. But Oh, that's really cool. But it's annoying when then you don't get to publish your stuff because everybody else is getting in the way. So let's hope. <laughs> about science, it's about progress. And in at the end, it's about helping people. So if my work has fostered someone else thought who has done the brilliant idea to, to solve the problem, then, you know, I'm proud of that. That's very humble, very humble. So I'm going to ask you a completely naive question, all right? So please help us to understand this. So yesterday in the conference, we, we were talking a lot about prevention of dementia, and we talked a lot about the research that's been related to um, modifiable risk factors for dementia, yeah. right? So, yeah. you know, talking about the fact, just to recap for people who may not understand what I'm talking about, you know, findings that, you know, indicate that there are things that people can do to reduce their risk for dementia. So maintaining physical activity, for instance, not drinking too much alcohol, for instance, not having depression, not being socially isolated, right? Yes. So not having COVID lockdowns, huh? Yeah. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. But so my question to you is, how does this relate to how pathology? Is this, you know, are, are these lifestyle factors somehow going to influence the, the mm. spread of tau pathology or you, yeah. you can say you don't know because i have no idea but can you no no yeah. no no i can i can i uh, think i can contribute to this discussion so so you you would believe that um if it changes really your risk and delays maybe or even in some people prevents we never know right we never know if they would have developed it then um you would imagine that it changes tau pathology if tau pathology is really the driver behind these deficits. So um, we, have, we have actually quite a bit of research going on in understanding the, the molecular events behind it. And the problem here is, as I mentioned already, if you do, even in, in large uh, human cohorts, you can find some indirect evidence for it. But to find direct evidence, you need to go, unfortunately, to the models. So we're looking at the moment at effects of dietary changes, um, of um, even genetic effects um, of, you know, backgrounds, um, exercise, um, but also events like uh, brain trauma and see how they all um, affect tau pathology and where, where the unifying factors are um, that we can then maybe even target with, with very specific um, treatments or prevention recommendations. The big problem is if you come with a treatment, who's going to take it? Because, you know, you would have to take it. Remember what I told you in the teenage years, first science, you would have to start taking your 20s for something that might happen in the 80s. That's going to be hard to convince people. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's, well, that, that's the problem with the lifestyle modification, which is also what we were talking about yesterday too. We all know we shouldn't drink too much. We all know we should do exercise and we shouldn't eat too much junk food. Um, but... We'll, you know, often um, modify our behavior successfully for short periods of time. But if you want to reduce risk for dementia, you've got to do that for 25, 30 years. <laughs> you have to stick to it, right? But, you know, I believe also endorphins are important. So, you know, every now and then indulge is as important for the brain as, as uh, you know, continuous exercise there. oh my goodness there you go now that we're all going to take that we're all going to listen to that and we're going to ignore everything ralph told us yesterday ralph martin told us about you know you <laughs> well, an impact at least <laughs> fantastic now i i have to say it's really cool that you have decided to produce your own mouse model and then sell that mouse model to other people around the world like i, I, don't, that sell. I, you I don't, don't sell i don't sell i give them for free without yeah. mpas oh my goodness that's even cooler but still, I think that's really impressive that you've actually been able to uh, to do that. Yeah, good on you. 
All right, so I did have a bit of a cheeky question um, for you. So I did say that you get points for making us laugh, and I really do have a very good laugh. And I'd just like to say, so I just want to quote you that Professor Lars Ittner does not recommend cannibalism of Alzheimer's brains. Is that correct? Yeah, I, like <laughs> it's taken out of context, but I remember I've said that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Because I was a little bit disturbed because several times in your presentation, you made reference to the different flavors of pal pathology. In fact, you said it about three times. Yeah. So when you talked about cannibalism, and then you talked about flavors of pal pathology, I... it made me wonder what evidence you, this uh, claim was based on. Of the flavor? Mm. That's, I think, a poor choice of words. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you for being a good sport. It's been wonderful to have you out today.